Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All Things Podcast, episode number 52, Workload Management. I'm your host, Matt Lawrence, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike Coran. If you've been enjoying the podcast so far and want to support us, there's a couple ways to do that. You can view us on the Apple po- on Apple Podcasts or on the Podcast platform that you're listening to this on. You can also check us out on Patreon. We only have two tiers right now, but the $3 tier will give you a shout out in the podcast, and we'll also share a link to your website inside of the show notes. And probably the most important one is just to actually share this, tell your friends, and let people know that would actually want to listen to us, that we're here and ready to be listened to. And of course, if you want to just hang out and chat or maybe ask some questions, we also have a Discord server, and you can find the link to that in our show notes as well. But like every week, we're going to start this out with our weekly pain point. So Mike, take it away. All right. Uh, welcome back. So our weekly, my weekly pain point this week has been not having enough time for personal projects. And it's a little bit related to our episode, which is workload management, but essentially just having so much work right now thrown into, I think, both of our laps right now that we can't focus on hat as much. And that has really been frustrating because I've been really wanting to get on the uh, hat website redesign phase because I was just getting started with uh, the sanity.io CMS and integration into the Nuxt.js front end with Vue. Uh, so that's been, and I was really getting excited for that because stuff was kind of getting together and I was moving on to the next phase of it, but, uh, just right dead in its tracks because of all the ridiculous work that I've been having to do. Not that I'm complaining because obviously having a lot of work means we're having a lot of, you know, it's paid work. So that's great. Good for our banks. Not so much for the hat content. Um, what about you, Matt? So same, same sort of thing with the workload. Um, but specifically, I've been kind of stuck with a specific problem, which Mike and I are actually kind of working on now. So I have it working. I have it working at the moment, but we're trying to find more of an, a more elegant uh, solution for it. And that is we're trying to basically interface with Webflow using JavaScript, which is supported via like they have like a script, like a script. I'm, I'm going to call it a script rich text field, but that's incorrect. But they have like a script to area where you can put it in there. But it's kind of a weird little problem that we have. Um. I don't know how I don't know if you'd want to describe it, Mike, because you said it's interesting from a programming perspective. But basically, what it is is we have to generate a set amount of random numbers that cannot repeat. I think that's it, right? What's the you said? Yeah, you said like, it's an interesting. You yeah, said, you, so, you said it was interesting. Like it feels really simple when I say it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it is like it does require a little bit of intricacy because it's like. Yeah, so so go go ahead right now, like everyone listening, uh, try this out. It's a it, it seems like a super simple problem. We need to generate a set like an, an array of random numbers. Uh, it, it's a dynamic based on a couple of different variables, but that's not important. Let's say we need to generate an array of five numbers w- from a pool of thirty numbers, right? Let's say that that's the case, and each number needs to be unique. So each number in that array needs to be unique and you need to make sure that the, the fact that you can change the numbers that a you need and the, and the pool that will work together as well. So that that's one facet of it. But the the interesting facet is how do you do it without having to um, have like a potential infinite loop? Because what you need to do is on, on every like unique number creation, you need to make sure that that's not already in there. So that that that's kind of where the comp- complexity lies. But you can go ahead and try it out. There are ways to do it. Matt found a way, uh, and I'm just trying to find a like a different way. And I, I automatically opened up a code pen and started coding. But then we we decided to kind of go into the podcast first. So I might post a solution for that on Twitter at some point when I when I uh, finish that solution. So stay tuned with our Twitter account. Uh, we'll probably post it on the hat Twitter account, but it's it's a cool little problem. So de- definitely to try it out. It's a good little mind buster for JavaScript. Uh, let me know what you guys come up with. Any 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 elegant solutions that I would want to like? I'm curious to see what everyone else can do. Yeah, because like the weird thing was is that I got it up and running relatively quickly, but the fact that two of the parameters are that we get to choose how many numbers dynamically, like just with a variable. So you can say like, hey, I want three unique numbers or four unique numbers or five unique numbers and also the pool of numbers changes so for example it's like a dynamic it's like a dynamic system in which 
it'll say like you know choose a choose a random number between one and thirty or choose a random number between like one and fifty or like one and sixty one and seventy and it's inclusive like it has to include the one and like the fifty and the thirty and the the seventy there so that was kind of one of those things where when one of them zeroed out i was getting stuck in the loop forever so that was one of like the little things where you don't really think of it. You're like, hey, this is working. And then all of a sudden you hit that condition and you're like, well, my browser doesn't work anymore because it's just going to crash because it's stuck in a loop. So it's just one of those weird little things. And I'm not the greatest at JavaScript. So, I mean, God knows what my solution, God knows how good my solution is. But anyway, <laughs> um, we're going to move on to uh, second number one, which is workload management. Uh, we're going to be kind of splitting this up into kind of 50-50. So I have a, I have like a bunch of workload management tips. Mike has a bunch of workload management tips. And then of course, we'll be going into our web news this week, which is a uh, modified personal procedure. And that's something that we've touched on a fair bit throughout the episode, but I've never had like a dedicated segment for, so stay tuned for that. But anyway, jumping right in here to workload management. And this is also something I've mentioned on the show a bunch, but I haven't really done a deep dive into. And that is my ticket-like management system. So as Mike, as Mike has said this week, has been kind of heavy for both of us. I've been quoting a heck of a lot of jobs and doing a bunch of jobs and doing little doing little plugins and that type of thing for other people that are like our existing customers. And so with a bunch of little tasks like that, I actually have to kind of utilize my ticket like management system. So before this, before I did web development, I did a bunch of IT work. I was working professionally in the IT field. And so I kind of learned to manage my workload with tickets. And so, and whereas like my system today is not as I guess formal as the other one was like, I don't have ticket numbers. I don't have like a ticketing software per se, but it's all based on tasks. And so depending on the size of those tasks, I'll act, I'll either make, make the, the each ticket or task separate per customer or separate per task across multiple customers. And I'll explain that. So for example, this little, this little mind trick thing that we just said, the little thing with the random numbers and all that, that is for a specific piece of functionality on a customer website. He has a couple of tasks for me to do. They're going, they're like smaller, but they're going to take me a little longer. And they're not very, they're not like at the front of the list because like the websites are up and everything. We're just kind of tweaking at this point. And so they, they are being separated into two separate tasks. Whereas this week, for example, we got a couple of larger contracts where one contract has a few websites in there. And the other one has one large website in there. So even though, even though I could, you know, separate everything into the little tiny tasks per, per, you know, per website for the one customer or per, you know, bits of the other larger website, instead, I actually have those two kind of ticketed in as two separate tasks. And how I manage that is, is, so for example, I'll just give, I'll just say what I did for the last two days. So yesterday, what I did was I worked completely on the one guy's website that was like the larger site. And basically what I tried to do was work enough so that I got ahead of him. And then I basically just kind of like sent them that. And then that, which I'll touch on in a bit, bought me some time. And then I was able to move on to this smaller task. But now I'm working on one of the two tasks for this customer. So I finished the one task quickly because it's 50% of the job. Now I can tell, tell that person, hey, I finished this job. And now that buys me again, I'll, and again, I'll touch on this later, but now that buys me time with them because now I've done something for them that's functional and ready to go so that they're not, you know, kind of sitting there, you know, tapping their watch saying like, hey, where's this guy? Why isn't he emailing me back kind of thing? And so that's kind of how I do the ticket system. Now, obviously you might be thinking like, well, you know, that it, the priority is the main thing. Like, how do you really prioritize people? And that, that's kind of something that's almost like a muscle memory for me at this point. I kind of... There's no right answer. You know, I could have started with the smaller task, bought time, and then went to the larger website. But it's all based on a variety of factors. So depends on the urgency, depends on who it is. So maybe you know the person, maybe you don't. Depends on what the project is. So whether you think that you're going to need to delegate the task, which which is something I'll touch on in a bit. Whether it's something that you'll need to delegate partially or fully to someone else in your staff member or on your team. Whether or not you, whether or not you need what would I, what would I say? I think it's like it, whether or not you would need extra or whether or not you need like downtime or extra time, or whether there's like an overhead to the task, I guess is the best way is the, probably the best way to say it. So if it's something really quick, like, Hey, you know, shoot me an email with these quotes, 
you're not taking down their website. There's no overhead to that task. So like, there's a bit of a less, there's a bit of a less tax on that. If that makes sense. It, 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 the reason why I'm kind of hesitating here is because it is, it is very much a muscle memory. You know, as long as you're performing the bare minimum for the customer, like you're hitting those deadlines, you're making sure that you're getting it right. You're, you're, you're kind of good to go. So always make sure you hit those deadlines, but prioritizing is kind of a weird art. And um, I'm sure Michael touched on it with his thing because I'm sure he he would do things even differently than I do. But what I always do try to do is I always try to buy myself time. Now, one of the things I touched on in that sort of then that sort of larger part was delegate when necessary. So, for example, we have a project coming up where we need to delegate one of the larger sections to a person that we're working with. But my part of the job is sort of information gathering and I'm kind of the communications liaison, if you will, for the moment. And so I want to get that done quickly, get it done right and everything, but I want to get that done quickly so that I can delegate it out, which clears up my schedule so I can do other things that I'm more involved in. And that, that sort of, that sort of ties into that overhead that I was saying is when there's overhead with a task, there's a lot of, you have to kind of like invest yourself in it, right? If you're trying to avoid downtime, you have to really invest yourself in it. You can't be doing two or three things, you know, talking with somebody, you know, you're on the phone, you're watching a YouTube video. You can't be doing all that stuff. You need to be really in there. And so that's, that's how that kind of plays in there. Um, also, I already mentioned too, that you can perform the bare minimum for customer satisfaction. So that kind of sounds like a bad way to do it. You're like, oh, you're just doing the bare minimum. However, don't perform the bare minimum like as in, hey, I'm just going to do a real bad job, but get it done just to send it to them. No, but if they're asking for one of three tasks to be completed by Monday and you, you know, you thought you would be able to get two done, but a bunch of work was thrown into your lap, just do that one task and pass it on to them. It may seem obvious, but some people, when they initially came up with the plan of doing the two of the three tasks, they'll actually get rather attached to those three tasks or the two to the two of the three tasks. And then they'll like kind of like they'll maybe do a worse job on both or they won't get them done in time and then it'll push something else back. So you kind of have to just, sometimes you just have to do what the bare minimum that the customer is, uh, the customer is actually expecting just to satisfy their need for work. Don't go above and beyond with your own discretion. And then another piece that i mentioned repeatedly over and over and over again was buying time by staggering objectives. So I have an example here. So in this example, if you have something that requires the customer to look over and give feedback on, sending it to them buys you some downtime on their project, which can be spent on others. So I'm going to touch on that overhead thing again. So a really prime example would be you, you're about to gear up for a big migration for a customer. And then another customer who isn't your customer yet calls you up and says, hey, I need a quote. Can you please quote me on this project? Now, if that migration, if you have a little bit of time, you could say, okay, I'm going to go and do that quote, which, you know, it has no downtime. It does no, you know, no real big stress. You're more or less writing a report and maybe checking out a few things, doing a little bit of research. But for the most part, there's none of that overhead. You know, you could be watching a YouTube video. You could be listening to music or whatever you're doing. You could be doing that easily while you do that. So then if you complete that quote quickly, now you've satisfied that customer. And they can go and do whatever they need to do. They can, you know, talk to their management team or they can, you know, think it over or maybe they want to call you and talk later or schedule a call. But all that stuff generally takes time, a day, a week, longer, really depends on the size of the company or the size of the customer's company or, um, or excuse me, the size of the customer's team, et cetera, et cetera. It's all depends on their overhead with that task. So now you can be fully engulfed in that task that has a bunch of overhead. You can make sure that migration goes smoothly. You can do, you know, after, after migration testing to make sure that everything came upright. You can really, really check every little thing so that you're not coming back to that migration being like, damn, I forgot this thing. And now this thing's down and it's a big mess. So that, that's what I mean by the, by the overhead. And, and I think if you've been in the, in this field or any field that requires you to sort of bounce around different jobs, I'm sure you know what I mean, because this, this, sort of task management is very, it's very universal. It's almost like, it's almost like medical triage, if you will, where you have to prioritize based on a set standard of, of, of things. It's the same with tech, except obviously not as serious as something that's medical, but that's basically what you're doing is you're doing like a technical triage where you're deciding what, you know, what priority, you know, what priority order you're doing. What's the reason for that? That's kind of what you're getting at. 
And I think I'll pass it on to Mike now so he can kind of talk about his various workload tips and tricks. I don't really know what to call this. Workload yeah, management no, it's, tips. It's, it's, it's work, <laughs> just workload management, essentially. But I, w- one thing I want to touch on that you were talking about, and I just want to explain a little bit to the audience why it, it seems like we don't have like a set method for dealing with everything. And we're just kind of, we do it, like, like you said, you kind of do it based on feel and based on uh, like your own kind of style. And that's mainly because every customer is different. And especially with Matt, he has to deal with uh, many customers at the same time. I'm, I'm more of a dealing with at least one customer. And in that, I do have to deal with a couple of different people, but it's a little bit easier to manage. But for, for Matt, uh, he has to deal with multiple different customers that are completely different from each other that don't know about each other that are, you know, they have different objectives, different sets of everything, like everything is different about them. They don't know, they don't know they, they exist and they think that they're like, when a customer comes to you, they, they don't care that you have other customers. They think that they're the most important thing ever at that very time that they come, that they've come to you. The issue comes is the fact that like Matt said, he'll, he'll do the staggering objectives to kind of uh, buy himself a little bit of time here and there, but he doesn't know how much time he's buying. So he can't really plan out, you know, even like a day or two ahead because he could send out an email with a quote and that could buy him some time. Maybe it'll buy him a day. It might buy him a week. It might buy him a month. We don't like our, the range of time that someone has responded to us has been so vast that it's literally impossible for us to predict when we're going to get a response. And this could be a response on even an urgent matter. Like Matt was talking about a few weeks ago with the false urgency thing. People use false urgency literally all the time. And then we like, we have now come to come to the realization that it's just their own method of communicating. It's not really a thing where they're like, this needs to be done this right away. We can do it right away, but we, and and send off a response, but they won't respond back to us, even though they're the ones that need it done. And so this, this provides the complexity in dealing and working with people and doing workload management on your own. So it's very difficult when you're working with many, many customers to actually plan out and manage your workload, even if you like you're talking a week ahead. So one one of the strategies is like like Matt was saying, kind of by the seat of your pants, try to do it day at a time, hour at a time, like hours at a time. You know what I mean? Like if you if you can somehow manipulate it so that you can at least plan out blocks of time that you can work on certain things and you can be a little bit, maybe not harsh with your clients, but you can be upfront with your clients and saying that, listen, there's multiple different clients that we have. We have many different quotes that we've sent out. So this could, everything can move up. Like the timeframes that you're talking about right now can only be accomplished within, if you respond within these timeframes. Now saying that to them will probably not do anything to be honest, because they have their own lives and they have their own thought process on how, your job should be done uh, for better or for worse. They they think that when they're, it's urgent for them, so you know, a two days before their deadline, they think that you can do it. And it really is up to you to, to explain to them that that's not how things work. Sometimes they'll listen, sometimes they won't. It's, it's a very, the, what I'm trying to say is it's a very complicated system to deal with if you want to deal with multiple clients at the same time, which is right now what Matt is doing. And what's kind of led to this episode, I think, <laughs> for for the most part. For sure, it's it's one of those it's one of those things where like I, I'm I'm kind of even trying to process it in my own head because it's it I can't even really think of how I do it. And I think I think it I think everyone kind of has their own strategy. And and, and a prime example is so last night I was stay I stayed up like super late, sent an email out with like a pretty large a pretty large section of someone's project that required customer feedback. And that was like previously discussed, like, Hey, I'm going to send you this. You're going to, you know, you're going to have to check it out. And then we're going to have a meeting right after. And what that actually did was buy me. I thought it was going to buy me 24 hours. And what it actually like, you know, bought me in terms of time was at least, at least 72 hours, I'd say. And so like the, the customer's happy, right? They've got their, they've got their thing clearly faster than they expected, or at least like within a reasonable time. And now, now I'm waiting on them and I'm not like flying by the seat of my pants in which like every single second has to be filled up with something, but that's kind of how, like, that's kind of how you should work as a, now it's like, now there is no panic for tomorrow. Now I can just maybe work on that second smaller task, or I can work on, you know, something else. And we have like the, like I've already mentioned, we have 
a kind of like a an array of websites coming up like from two different customers across two different customers. So like now I can slowly chip away at those bigger projects because those clients are aware that those are larger projects. So now I could spend a bit of time with them so that when this other project that I just bought time for comes back at me, I can stop the larger project, go and kind of do the rapid fire part of like, you know, helping the, helping this, this original client with content while I, that, then I can go back to the larger company, like to the larger, the larger projects. It, it sounds crazy. Like it sounds like I'm just sort of babbling on, but it's, it really is like a flow. It's almost like a muscle that you get in your brain where you're like, I need to do this, call this person, check this, do that. And it even comes down to sending emails at certain times. So not that like I'm going to say like I need to send this specifically at like three in the morning or like three in the afternoon or something. But it is something like sometimes you'll say to somebody, hey, I need to like I'll have this done by Friday, but you don't specify a time. Sometimes if you know that person is going to be gone over the weekend and you need to work on something over the weekend and that person just so happens to constantly like answer email relatively quickly and always add something on. What you could do is you could just send it to them at the end of the day Friday when you know they're gone. So that you can work over the weekend on your other customers thing and then then have that other person, the original person, contact you on Monday. And now you've just bought yourself 48 hours essentially for those other two projects. So it it's weird. Like it like I've never said this out loud, which is why it's weird to me. Like I've never really thought of like this is how I do it. Like I'll say certain things to Mike like, oh, you know, we, you know, we have 48 hours. Like they're not going to bug us for 48 hours. So let's go and do this. Like I, I'll say stuff like that because I realize it's happening. But it's just it's weird kind of laying it out because I've never really thought of it. Like if you asked me to write a Medium article or just an article or a blog post, whatever, on this, I really would struggle with it. Like it would take me a while to write it down because – it's almost just like a muscle memory. It's just like driving. It's like, I don't really notice I'm hitting the gas pedal. I just do it now, right? I hit the gas pedal, I hit the brake. I don't really think to myself, I'm now hitting gas pedal. You know, I'm now have to apply the brake, you know? Yeah, exactly. And the, the weird thing is, is that like, if you look at uh, like best practices and if you look at like larger agencies, um, they'll have systems in place to kind of elevate this where, like I said before, They'll have hard cutoffs for clients to not, you know, answer them. And if they don't answer them by this date, then they'll be moving on to different projects and they'll be put on the back burner, stuff like that. Like they'll have they'll have all that written out in the contract and stuff. But from what I've experienced myself, you can do all that. You can put all those systems in place. I mean, if you have a large team, that's probably necessary and you, you can't really get around it. But even with all those systems in place, even with your large teams, you're always going to have to adapt because like you're going to have a situation where yes you've you've told them you like they they have to get their email in at, at before the 11th of September right or something like that and if they don't get it in then we have to move on to a different thing but if they get it in on the 14th of September you know like and they they're in an urgent state and they're they've already paid their 30% down payment or something like a, for a large company you're going to probably accommodate that and usually they do as far as like from what i've seen out there in the industry like they'll they'll complain about it internally and be like oh this guy did an email at that time but they'll be like okay we'll assign jim to it and jim will get get uh, get the task done like it's it's a weird system that you always have to adapt to and each, each client is different like some clients are really go getters and they'll go 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 and they'll get you all the information you need and that's fantastic most clients are not some one of the more frustrating things to me is when a client is uh, or anyone you're really communicating with is con- like in a go getter at it like go getter state and you're getting getting done getting done you're getting to a really good state and then all of a sudden they go dark and they go quiet even though you're in like a, an emergency like you need them to answer this question or you need them to send you this content at, to get to get it out by their deadline like their set deadline but but they've gone dark even though they've been you know fairly responsive before that like stuff happens in people's lives adapt like that that's that's kind of where i what i try to do now like instead of setting these crazy you know limitations and stuff and not i'm not going to say we're not going to do that at some point but right now since we're a two man operation with ex- like slowly expanding with contractors we can kind of be the more personable operation we can we can uh do it maybe not by the seat of our pants but like by our feel of the projects as we go on, maybe we will have to put in a little bit of, you know, bureaucracy into it. But again, I think it's okay that we're doing it like this. And when you're a one person operation, I think it's okay for you to go in and feel out all these situations and, and kind of go through it logically. 
like be a be a human being about it if if, if that makes sense uh and it'll give you a good perspective on your future you know if you if you do expand your company it'll make it easier for you to put timelines and put dates and then be also human with people during those timelines and dates and stuff like that i think i think it's a good skill to have um one of the things but, actually if you yeah. don't even don't mm-hmm. maybe cutting in there right there is that yeah for sure one of the things i'm noticing is that you can tell when people haven't like, we're not masters of this, so I was going to say master of the art of this, but you can tell when people don't sort of have this prioritization system inside of their head and when they work with customers, when they panic over everything. Like if a customer says like, hey, my Twitter logo is like a slight shade of blue that like, you know, is a little bit off. It's a couple shades off from the actual Twitter color. That's not a like, don't panic. You know what I mean? Like some people will panic and I'm like, God, like, man, calm down. Like their customers aren't going to complain that the Twitter logo is slightly off, you know? Let's 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 take it down a notch. And you can and and I get the like I'm not a psychologist or whatever, but I do get the impression that the people who don't prioritize with customers are the people who will call you every time, freak out about stuff like that. Even when you say like, "Hey, I'm gonna be a week," they'll call you in two days, and they're like panicking. It's usually other techs I find. It's usually when there's another tech, it's like they're they're panicked all the time. Like, what's going on here? Why is it not like? Why is it not done? What's going on? It's like, well, I don't know. Like, why are you freaking out? Like, it's within the timeline. Calm down. Yeah, exactly. I, I, it, it, it's a weird system and it's a weird uh, environment that we live in uh, with being web developers and probably other industries as well suffer from the same kind of problem. Anytime you have to deal with multiple clients at the same time, it's always going to have a certain situation like this. Um, another thing that I have to deal with uh, at the same time is just multiple ticketing systems. It's one thing that it, it I think it's a my problem right now, uh, like currently is one of my clients has their own ticketing system. Like they use Jira and I personally use a, a couple different things. What, the main thing I'm using right now is a to-do list called Todoist. So dealing, having to integrate with both ticketing systems when I have a large, like many projects that I'm working on is kind of a pain and, and it it almost requires its own project management on top of it. So every day I'll like in the, in the morning or in the evening, I'll go, I'll sit down and I'll go through all of my different ticketing systems and I'll make sure that I've covered everything in all the different ticketing systems. And I also kind of try to, uh, like I, I, I try to combine the different tickets. So one of them I'll keep more generic and then I'll put more specific ones in my to-do list. So if I need to do little tasks, I'll put them on to-do list, but in my, in the Jira for my client, I'll do more generic a sounding tasks that encompass many different little tasks in them so that I, I don't get overwhelmed with a, with a ton of small things. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a tough system to flow through, but it's something I think is pretty common with contractors. So if you're a contractor uh, and you're working within a com- within a different company contracting there and you have your own contracting stuff that you're doing on the side as well, it, you have to kind of deal with it. So it's an interesting environment. Maybe it would be better for me to just adapt to whatever ticketing system my clients are using at that time. So maybe it would be better for me to just go into Jira and use that as my personal ticketing system. I, I, I'm not sure about that yet, but that's kind of been my current struggle. Um, it hasn't been too, too bad. I've been kind of dealing with it, but I feel like I've, I've been spending too much time inside of task management lately. So I need to probably uh, tighten that up. Um, the other thing that I do uh, when you're working on a ton of projects is you're constantly context switching and I've talked about this a lot with context switching where like if you're switching from one project to another within a matter of like 10 minutes or 20 minutes because someone's contacted you with a bug about another project it takes you some time to spin up and get acquainted again with that project even if you are working on both of them very closely it still takes you a little bit of time you know to open up your your code environment to start running your dev servers on that project to figure out where you were before you stopped and stuff like that. Like it's still a, at least a 10 minute, 20 minute spin up time. Uh, sometimes a little bit faster, sometimes a little bit slower, but in, in that general range. So switching between projects is in my opinion, pretty detrimental. Sometimes it's necessary um, because stuff happens and you have to go. But what I like to do is I kind of block off some time where I'm only working on one project. And I mentioned this before, but it's kind of an important thing to, to note is like, if, if you have many projects on the go, it, it, you should try to kind of give at least blocks of time for each one and try to do it so that when you're working on one block of time, unless an urgent text comes in or an urgent email, don't read emails about the different projects. So I, I, I do read continuous communication. 
Um, I do believe in that, but when it's, when you're working on several different projects, I like to do it so that if communication comes in about that project while I'm working on it, I'll do it because it's not going to distract me too, too much because it's in the same context. But if it's from a different project, I'll try to offload that onto my either like dedicated communication time or when I'm starting to work on that project, I'll answer those emails. That's kind of how I like to handle it. It's been working pretty well for me at this point. I, I've been getting better and better at context switching. I've been getting better at blocking off time. So it's it, it's kind of an adapting sort of thing that you have to get better at because you're, you're it's not going to be easy at first. I can guarantee you that. Um, so the other thing is, is I like to be, when I work on projects, I like to be in a position where I'm project planning as well. So I don't want to be like, as a contractor, some, a lot of times you'll get into the position where you have to work with a project planner. I'm not a big fan of those kinds of situations. Not that you can avoid them all the time, but when you can be part of the project planning team as a contractor inside a project, it's a lot easier for you to manage all the different other projects you're working on at that time. Because obviously you can be like, well, if we need to do this sprint this week to get these features out, I know that it's going to take me around this amount of time, but I also need to work on this other project. So I know that that's going to take me a amount of time. So you can kind of plan it out accordingly with because you have the knowledge how long it takes you to do certain things. That, that That's where I, I like, I try to kind of manip, not manipulate, but I try to at least influence the project management a project planning portion of each project that I work on. So I'm not like just sitting in the back seat and waiting for people to give me stuff. I try to actually plan it out. I try to, I try to interact with the entire team to make sure that I know what their capabilities are. And I try to help them with project planning and stuff like that. So it's, it's one, it's something that I've been trying to do more and more of. Uh, and it's been working out great for me. I have, I've been lucky because most of the projects are still with kind of one client we are working on multiple projects for that client and it's constantly evolving on a daily basis. Uh, but it's given me the opportunity to actually be the project planner and to be a manager and stuff like that. And I, I, I think I'm lucky in that perspective. The other thing that's uh, really important and Matt was talking about it before is prioritization. Uh, so what I, what I like to do is almost on an everyday basis or even twice a day at start of day, end of day, I look at priorities um, and see if I'm doing everything in the correct order, because obviously some projects are more are more important than others at this current time, because you need to there's a deadline you're meeting or something or there's a meeting coming up that people are going to be talking about or there's training coming up for a certain things. So what I like to do is during stand ups. So these are just like daily meetings. They're usually pretty short. At the end of the standup, after everyone's had their chance to tell them, tell people what they're, what they've done yesterday, what they're planning to do today, I like to bring up prioritization. And in that sense, like we know that this project needs to be done first. This, this task needs to be done second. This task needs to be done third. And I'll do it almost every day during the standups because priorities change and that kind of sucks sometimes because as you're planning you don't know what the priorities are going to be like because again meetings can come up training can come up stuff like that uh, but for the most part at least you can get your days organized and that's that's what I try to do the most of is instead of focusing on organizing my whole week like I'll have an overarching plan for the whole week but it's not it's a very loose one because I know I'll have to adapt I try to do very a strict daily plan. So at least I'm getting a lot accomplished during the day and I'm not, you know, panicking because I have tasks all over the place. As long as I have my priority set for the day, I'm good to go. And these priorities can change the next day. That's not a problem for me because I can, again, reorganize my day, reprioritize it and have my entire day to work on that. So those are kind of the tips that I would give for working with a lot of different projects and workload, workload management when you're talking about a lot of different things on the go. When it's a single project, it's a, it's a little bit more, a little, a little bit simpler. So when you're first starting out, don't think that this is going to be the, you know, the system that you're going to put in or the panic that you're going to have. Uh, it's a, it's a lot easier to do one project at a time. And I would keep it that way a little bit, especially if you're just one person. Uh, but as you grow and your company grows, you got to be able to adapt. And these are the kinds of methods that I do use on a daily basis to be able to manage multiple projects and to be able to work on many, many different things, because not only do we have all this, Matt and I also have hat, uh, HTML, all the things, the podcast that you're listening to now. So we have to, you know, create the podcast notes every week, we have to record the podcast, we have to make sure that it's like edited, that's Matt, Matt does that, like, all that has to be planned, 
on top of all the client work. So you need to, we need to be really, really good at prioritizing and making sure that we're working on multiple projects, making sure that we we can do many things at once. Because again, there's other stuff that we would really like to do. Like I said before in my weekly pain point, I would really like to work on hat, like the hat website. Um, but it's just like, there is a limit to everything. So I'm trying like th- this week, I've kind of given myself some time to work on it. Uh, but last week, unfortunately, it was really, really, you know, really, really busy with all the different client work. So that's also part of your workload management is knowing when to be like, okay, this is not a paying project right now. So I can move it to the side for a little while. I don't like to move things to the side for a long time because I'll forget what I was doing. So I try to at least touch on it once a week if I, if I, it, it's in that state, but, uh, that, that's kind of the, the way I go about it. One of the things that one of the things that you mentioned that I really liked was the fact when you were talking about priorities, you mentioned that you knew what to do for that one day, because there's a few things in there in your planning that is obviously different to mine. Because like I mean, everyone's going to be different. Like you prefer to have a block of time for certain projects, and I will when it has that large overhead. Like I said, but oftentimes I'm exporting a video while watching something on YouTube, and also like. I don't know, fixing my own, my own server while something is saving on like for work. Like it, it, just like my desk, my computer situation is usually chaos, but the fact that I have a priority for that day and for days ahead means like there's no panic. So like, sometimes I'll just be like, okay, this email or whatever has to be sent today. So once I send that, yes, there's other stuff to do, but at the end of the day here, that email has to go out. And so I'll be kind of like chipping away at a whole bunch of stuff. Because I'm kind of more chaotic just in general. Like, as you mentioned, I deal with a lot of different customers, a lot of different things. And so sometimes a person will call and just want something like it's totally random, totally random call, but it's something really small. And so like, I'll sometimes just stop what I'm doing, just quickly do it because I I know that person's not going to call me again for at least another week or whatever. And then I'll just kind of move on. And so I, I, but I kind of prefer the chaos sometimes. Like I'm, I get kind of bored very easily if I was just sitting down, like even writing these even writing these show notes, like I'll get bored and I'll kind of go do something else and then I'll go and like have something else running. And I always have something going on. It's either a podcast playing or like even that, right? Like even the background noise is consistent with me. There's always something going on that I'm doing. And so, you know, if you're one of those people and you're not as organized, like Mike is probably much more organized than I am. Like I rarely use our task manager software. Like we, (laughs) we use Asana and like, I'm, like I'm in there. Sure. Like some stuff, especially like larger projects, stuff with that overhead. Like I mentioned again, sure. Like I'm in there all the time, but then I mean, otherwise like all this stuff that I've been doing the last three days, if I were to disappear, you would literally find about four emails and you'd be like, where are we in all these projects? Like, what are we doing? What's happening? And you wouldn't know (laughs) because I didn't write any of it down. So it's just, it's just one of those, it's just, if you're, it's just different people, right? Is I guess what I'm trying to get at. So if, if you're one of those people that think you're well time managed and customers are happy with your pace and all that type of stuff, but you're not like us, I mean, that's totally fine. Not everyone is the same way. It's not like, it's not like email etiquette where it's like, don't be yelling at your customers in emails. You know what I mean? Like nobody should be doing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not like, no, no, that's part of my procedure. I just scream at my customers in email in all caps. Like, what do you mean? It's like, no, that's, that's something that you shouldn't be doing. But, it, you know, you you starting or whatever, three or four emails and just having rapid fire conversations all over the place, as long as you're able to keep track of it, who cares, right? Who, I mean, unless you're, I don't know, logging it for someone specific, who cares? So um, so I think we'll move on to the, the web news here because this is also something that we've touched on quite a bit throughout the show, but never really kind of dove into. And I've titled it Modified Personal Procedure. So this kind of, this is kind of talking about UI, UX when working for something on yourself. And I'll kind of read through these show notes here. And then I'll be asking some of the questions and then Mike and I can, of course, do our, do our fighting. So anyway, (laughs) our fight to the death at the end of our web news every week. Uh, When you're, when you're working on a project for yourself, you may, um, you may want to cut some corners when it comes to non-customer facing UX and UI. And this is in order to save time. Now, while this is a valid way to save time, we've mentioned on the show a few times that you don't want to create a really bad UX or user experience for yourself, or else you won't even want to work on your own project. With that being said, it's it's a good idea to pick up and choose, or to pick and choose, sorry, exactly what you'll be cutting corners on and how much hassle you'll be adding to your own plate. So, for example, the hat website, the existing one, is a prime example of this. 
where we have a basic and unstyled admin panel. However, all the fields are in the right order. Some of them fill, fill themselves with the information so we don't have to like retype it in. And that's all for convenience and speed. I don't care that it looks bad. It just works and it's not customer facing. So who cares? Now on the flip side of this, everything customer facing, like I mentioned, or public facing is specifically it, really needs to be polished and have no harsh edges. So this kind of leads into the question, the questions, I guess I should say. What kind of modified procedure do you apply to your personal projects? What corners are you willing to cut and how much extra work are you willing to take on to shorten your development time? And last but not least, do you think that personal projects should mirror normal ones and actually have no cut corners at all? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll tackle this from a, a little bit of a different perspective. So in our, our, our client project currently that I'm, that we're working on, um, and this is not a personal project, but it has a side to it. So it has a UI side that clients see, right? Like that, like customers will see, but it also has an administrative side that only like the developers or the designer would see uh, just to do some manipulation. And that side, actually, I do a lot of it in JSON. Uh, which is just like a regular kind of code language. And a lot of the administration side, so the menu, the configuration and stuff like that uh, is done through JSON. So version con version control numbers and uh, different like Boolean, true and false. Like, is it an app mode? Is it not an app mode? Stuff like that. That's done just purely through, you know, writing true or false in a JSON file. Um, different things like, adding catalog information is also done through JSON currently. So it can be done in a, I have it set up so that you can kind of set a, a spreadsheet. So you can have a, a Google Sheets spreadsheet and then you can convert that to CSV. And then, uh, sorry, Google Sheets spreadsheet, download it as CSV, convert that to JSON, and then just upload that to the, to the as a configuration to your app. And it will take all that and parse through it, like the application will parse through it and do what it needs to do. Uh, but I think that in most cases, JSON is pretty straightforward. It's very English based. So, you know, you see, you know, app mode, true or false. As long as you're talking about developers looking at it, it's not a big deal. The other, the other thing, the other side to it is that, that JSON is very extendable. Because what I'm thinking, like, obviously, right now we have a very small team, so it's very possible. But as you enlarge, like, as you make that team larger, as your, as your team becomes less tech savvy, but needs to still control some of the configuration, the JSON allows me to have a backend created that will then be able to interface with that JSON and then create it for the app to use. So it's kind of like a, a way for me to then in the future, create a front end for that JSON which will then manipulate and create that JSON for the app to use. So in, in a sense, I'm kind of doing a half-baked solution to a modified personal procedure, I guess, uh, because I'm using a very, you know, rudimentary, you know, development form of control. But I am thinking about a future solution where I will be able to open it up to other people that aren't as tech savvy because I've done it this way and it's an extensible way of managing my application. So that's that's one thing that like what kind of that that's a modified procedure I would say that I would do to to a personal project is again having a you know that that for that stepping stone step of just using JSON and then from JSON create a experience to modify that JSON and as separate from your you know your your UX UI experience for your clients that's where I that's where I go to that um, other than that for like a, a regular project like Hat. We've we've learned that it's it's better to have something that works straight away and that is easier for us to, you know, upload and, you know, be able to edit our blog posts or be able to, uh, you know, set a time when the blog post is released. It's much easier to have all those features built in instead of just building a really rudimentary form for us to be able to just upload and nothing else. So we, we had that we went through an iterative process where like the first thing I did was I was you were able to just up like literally make a blog post, but you couldn't edit it. So every time you needed to create, like do any sort of edits, you have to delete that blog post and recreate it completely from scratch, which is obviously terrible UX. And even though it was just for Matt and I to use, uh, it was still terrible and we didn't want to use it. Like Matt said, like even when it's just for you, when it's something you don't want to use, you're going to have much less motivation to make that project something great. So 
I do think that there should be there shouldn't be so much as cut corners in, in a sense like I don't think that the corners that I'm willing to cut is how it looks I guess but not the functionality of it so if if we if I were to create let's say the hat website from scratch I would probably do the JSON route like I did before but every feature that we need in that JSON route. So if you want to do a delayed schedule, it has to be in that JSON. Every feature that we need for quality of life had, would have to be in that JSON package, that JSON file. Otherwise, I don't think it's worth it. That's that's the, the corner I would cut would probably be the UI of it more than anything, not the UX. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Like, I think the... Because the UX is, is really what makes something pleasant, right? It's It's really... So a prime example that we've done actually is that we had a WordPress site that was like a stock photo site. We've mentioned on the on earlier episodes of the of the show and it was called Free Photos Hamilton. And it worked like, you know, to in terms of what the customer saw, they could download free photos and they could download like a zip of a bunch of photos and they could see a gallery like it was, you know, fully featured. But for us it was a matter of okay, so you go out and take the pictures, that was fine. It was just sort of like a hobby, so that's fine. But then you have to come back, export the photos, and then I and then at first it was you couldn't just download them you had to actually make put them into zips. So even if somebody wanted to upload a, a specific fo- like just one specific photo and have that downloadable, they would have to put it into a zip folder. But then because you're putting it into a zip folder now there's no preview, so you have to put it in the preview. But then the previews didn't automatically compress, so it's like now you have to make a compressed version. So now you're like, you know, you're post processing an image just to display it for download at full resolution, and with that, you know, with the zip and everything else, like eventually some of that stuff got better. We made it so you could just download the photos and that, but some of the stuff never got better. And it was due to our lack of experience at the time with WordPress. It was years ago now and that type of thing. And it was just, it was just one of those, one of those sites where it just, it didn't work out and it was for us. So we left it cause we were like, Oh, it'll be fine. But every single time I went out, took photos, came back. I was like, man, I don't want to sit here for like eight hours. Cause I have like a hundred photos here or whatever. And post process these photos just to upload them and then the website was new so it wasn't really getting many views it wasn't like i was uploading it for an audience of like a thousand or like even just a thousand or even just a hundred it was literally just upload the photos and maybe get like two or three views on there like it was a bit of a mess for sure like it was definitely a lesson in both wordpress and like everything like we learned quite a bit from that project wordpress management ux stuff like it was a big mess and a lot of the people that were helping us which were our friends like people we knew they actually didn't want to upload on there either like they did in the beginning but it just one of those things where the ux was just terrible and so now we know that hey we need this ux to be better and that actually led to one of the big things that's been coming up a lot recently which is the ux of a cms and we've been talking about this here and there on our discord channel and we've also been talking like mike and i've been talking and i've been talking with customers about this as well where i really like a cms to actually hold the customer's hand so that they can't make a mistake because why wouldn't you like why would you want them to even have the chance of making a mistake further than a typo you know like instead of having the customer type in the same thing like a category name every time have a category selector you know that's that that's a no-brainer that's in most cms's but i'll go even further i'll have toggles for hiding things and the only thing they can do is hide it or or not hide it they don't have to worry about like pasting something in every single time or forgetting to paste it in it's just a toggle so if they forget it they go back in they click a button it's toggled on now that whatever it was a photo or whatever is now displayed period that's it there's no big deal right there so that that that's sort of the difference that's sort of the difference that that project made in our eyes and you're right. Like the UI can definitely suffer. I really don't care if I'm looking at, you know, an HTML 1.0 form essentially. But if imagine even now, like imagine even now, like we don't have a schedule right now, which is a bit of a pain in the ass. But imagine if we didn't have those links. So like we have the availability bar, which is what we call it the availability bar. That's with all the links that actually show up to say like the podcast is available in all these places. If that wasn't in that specific order, because we have a like a Trello list that helps us with it. So if that wasn't in the same order as the Trello list and that and that some of those links don't change and those weren't automatically pasted, that's just a pain. And that, you know, that ruins the experience. It's like, oh, I don't want to like log in and do this. And you might be like, well, it's lazy, but it's like, yeah, but you're supposed to be using the computer slash the website as a tool and you're like taking away some of its functionality. And that's that's a really good way of putting it, I think, Mike, is the fact that the UX is really what really what makes the difference. The UI and the UX together is absolutely a more customer-facing thing, 
where they specifically want to see a nice UX and a nice UI. Like they don't want to be digging into the JSON files like you mentioned and that type of thing. But at the same time, for us, I would be fine with with messing with the JSON as long as it wasn't something weird like, oh, you have to exit all your characters and you have to, you know what I mean? Like as long as the UX of even using the JSON isn't crazy. It, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so... Like it's a small it, and small things do matter quite a bit. Like we've been talking about the scheduler uh, over and over again, but it's like it is something that that annoys Matt and, and myself because uh, he's not able to he has to go in and create an entire blog post at a very specific time to be able to put it out there. And who knows if he's available at that very specific time, because what, what happens when you create a podcast and you publish it, it takes time for all the other podcasting platforms to propagate. So CastBox and Spotify and stuff won't get it immediately when we hit publish. We have to wait an indeterministic amount of time before we can hit publish. And with the fact that Matt can't go in and create the blog post beforehand and then, you know, edit it later because we don't have a draft system, right? Like we don't have any sort of draft system in place. He has to come in at the, at a very specific time whenever all those things have propagated and then go and create it uh, is a pain in the ass, like a pain in the butt for for Matt, really. So again, it's a small little thing, but it's a UX thing. So it, it should be in there and it will like it already is in the new system, the new the new hat system that we're creating. Those kinds of really small things like the toggle buttons and all that are all going to be in our own hat HTML like website, even though it's just for Matt and I for now, it's still going to be in there. And not only that, the UI is going to be pretty good. Like we're using sanity.io, which gives us a, a, a generic UI for right off the bat. So I don't even have to go in there and create anything. Matt doesn't have to go in there and design anything for it to be like usable and like good, you know, well, like decent to look at because that's also a nice to have. It's not, like I said, it's, it's a corner that I'm willing to cut, but it's obviously not something that I want to cut. Like I, I want it to be there already. Like I would rather it look good. I want, I would rather it be, you know, presentable because if I'm going to go show someone like show a friend or something, look, this is what we've created. This is how we edit it. They can take a look and be like, okay, so that it looks pretty sweet. So, and I want like, if I had the time, I would say no cut corners, right? Like even if it's a personal personal project, because I want to treat a personal project as if it's a so, something that anyone can see at any time. But the problem is, especially right now, is we don't really have the time to say no cut corners. So something does have to be cut. And out of those things, you UI is the one thing that I would if I had to. Uh, th that's all I would say about like cutting corners. But I think it's an important topic. Like when you're designing something for yourself, the other thing that we can talk about a little bit is commenting and being able to like uh, build it out further. Because sometimes when you do something for only you to see, you kind of forget to comment and you forget to do any sort of clean code practices. But it's something that really you should practice all the time. I think that there there shouldn't be any cut corners there, in my opinion, especially if it's going to be something that customers use at some point or even if, it, even if it's just something that you use. If you want to go back to it two, three years down the line, do you really think you're going to be able to read your code back then? Like even if you wrote, you know, decent code. The problem is, is that as you evolve, as you go on in your journey, and it happens pretty rapidly, you get better and better and better. And you start using different techniques, going back a couple of years, do it right now. If you're if you've been coding for multiple years, go and look at one of your like second, third, fourth projects, and see if you can understand what you're writing there and why you were writing it without any comments, if you didn't write any, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, so I, I do believe in not maybe writing comments all the time, but writing comments when they're needed, like I said before in, in a few other podcasts, uh, you know, when you're writing code, make it a legible to read without comments. And when, when needed, add comments to explain further and more complicated functionality. And, and that, uh, that almost falls into itself of if, if it being a UX thing, even if it's, if it'll never be hit the public or never hit anyone else, but you, if you have to go in there and fix something smaller, you want to add something. That's a UX thing too. You're like, oh, I don't want to go back in there because I don't, I didn't comment anything, and I gotta figure out what I did. And if it's been years, maybe your coding style has changed, or you've gotten better or worse at things, or like whatever. Like maybe some things are out of practice. Maybe some things are in more practice than ever, and you were out of practice back then, right? So your coding style has changed, and and now you've ruined the user experience for yourself just to go back and even look at your code, and so. 
like really, like really, like the, what this conversation has come down to is it's really UX. It's really, it really is. But I, I do agree with you saying that no cut corners would be nice. Like that's one of the reasons why we had a discussion of because I use Webflow a fair bit in in regular client work. Do I just say the heck with this? Let's just use Webflow because that is a you know complete thing. I can't I can't have a janky CMS because it's the Webflow CMS. I can't have a janky UI because then the customers wouldn't code up. So like you know I'm I'm kind of fenced in in all angles i have to have something good for the customers and then i'm forced to have something good for us which would be the cms because it has to be like that it's the it, they control it i don't control it and that's a really good that's a really good way to put it and the thing is too is like i think we cut corners with a lot of things for ourselves as well like for example like i like to kind of mess around with servers just on my off time like i have a bunch of servers in the house and just kind of mess around with them like a lot of my data like moving stuff around and all that kind of stuff can definitely be automated with cron jobs or whatever and maintenance and that type of thing but i just don't do it and i don't do that but just because just because like i'll just do it who cares like it's my own personal thing but there are times where it's like you know you have a busy week and it's like oh this update came up and it's like i should have just made this thing automatically update like why am i like messing around with it i think it's just i think it's just really easy to just think to ourselves like oh i just want to start using this thing i'll just you know i'll do it later but i think that you're right in if there is time available, then maybe you should just do it. And even though it takes more time, especially if it's a repeat task, it'll probably end up saving time in the long run. And that's like a really kind of a critical thing that you would want to do. Like, you know, you set it, you set, imagine setting somebody up on, on really janky hosting. That's just a, you know, recipe for disaster. But if you set them up on hosting that, you know, has a 99.9% .9 uptime or what have you, and they're not messing around with the hosting, hosting stuff themselves, they'll probably be up for years and be fine. Right. You may have a couple of downtimes along with everybody else in that hosting service, but it won't be a downtime because you specifically set them up with some weird janky hosting or set them up with some really rickety like WordPress procedure that they accidentally pressed update on a on a plugin or something like that and just like destroyed everything. And you didn't save, you didn't have a backup. So now it's like this whole procedure. So it, you're right. Like it's almost like we should almost polish everything UI, UX, inside and out. But the, the, priority would be most definitely on the ux i would say i definitely agree with that for sure i don't really know yeah. if I, I don't really know if i have anything else to add to this particular conversation i think i think that's like a really good kind of outline in that ux matters even if it's just you i agree i think we i think we covered it pretty pretty well i think that that's a good concise statement ux matters even if it's just you that's a tagline right there. For some reason, I get the, and this is really weird. I kind of get the impression that that's like the, that's like the slogan of a bank. I don't know why that sounds like a slogan of a bank. No. I think it might be because banks like to use, and this is like my opinion, banks like to use the word you in their slogans. And other companies do it as well. Mm -hmm. But I seem to notice like the you part of everything. Like, you know how like you'll be, they'll be talking about, I mean, this is like a tangent now, but you remember how, you know how like they'll be talking about investing and they'll be like the, you know investing is really cool and everything and you have like all these all these like investment tools and all that but what the investment doesn't know but all these investing tools don't consider is you you know what I, you know what i'm trying to you know what i'm getting at and then they're like yeah. they're like we add the you to investing come invest at like this like sketchy investment bank.com like you know whatever it is and so w watch that watch that'll be an actual website that someone goes to i i don't know of that website don't go to that but anyway um <laughs> I just I just yelled out a sample website name, but you know what you know exactly what I mean. Is it, like it seems like that as part of their UX. But anyway, uh, I think we can run the own conclusion unless you have anything else to add to this episode. Runner up. Alrighty, well, thank you for listening, and make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing on the platform of your choice. You can follow us on the socials via at HTML All the Things. That's on Facebook and Instagram. You can also follow follow us on uh, Twitter, and that's via at HTML Everything. We are on Medium. And we're on GitHub. And we're also on Patreon. Remember, that's patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. Check out the tiers and give that a go. And with that said, many thanks to our $3 tier patrons. Sean from Rabbit Works JavaScript. You can find him at youtube.com slash Rabbit Works JavaScript. Works is spelled W-E-R-K-S. You can also, or many thanks also to Garrick from Local Path Computing and Web Design. That's uh, localpathcomputing.com. Craig, a.k.a. Cosworth. And last but not least, Ryan Gatchel from Blue Black Digital. You can find him at blueblackdigital.com. All of these links will also be in the show notes. Feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you are listening to this on. And we are signing off. Yeah.